Well, welcome back to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses. It's not the win we were hoping to be speaking about, Callum. Two away wins in 17 games domestically this season. Really not what we were hoping for. Just the four clean sheets all season. But I suppose, Callum, if we want to have some form of optimism that you'd normally bring to this episode is that our top six hopes remain alive. Is that easing your hangover at all this morning? Uh, a little bit. It's quite the miracle that it's still not impossible yet. And maybe quite likely given uh, Hibs have got to play Hearts. Um, but yesterday, it's, it's just unbelievable that we didn't win. And yeah, it's very believable, I suppose, when you rattle off those statistics. Just typical, really. Yeah, I know. Like how you say it's believable that um, given Hibs have to go to Tynecastle, but also requires us to beat Ross County That's for true. the first time this season. <laughs> so um, maybe taking away any optimism that, that people um, have. But we'll come on to the top six permutations and the Ross County game um, slightly later on. Of course, we will look back at, um, whilst we're recording this on Sunday afternoon, um, yesterday's really disappointing 2-2 draw column that on the grand scheme of things now, really did neither team any benefit in terms of league aspirations, Aberdeen top six in Europe and, and Dundee in terms of automatic survival. Basically, we are in ninth though now, so yeah. steady progress. <laughs> Moving on up. Exactly. Moving. <laughs> wow, that, that was beautiful. I hope you're all enjoying that at home as much as I did. Yeah, that certainly cheered me up. Um, it was just... It was one of those games. I was convinced it was going to be nil-nil uh, after about sort of 20 minutes, half an hour. I thought it was just going to be one of those days. In fact, we scored a couple of goals. That's a bit of a miracle as well. But <laughs> God, I hope all they're doing between now and the Ross County game is defending set pieces in training. Yeah, that, that I suppose that Jim Goodwin quote about sorting out our defence, that's kind of going to be the easiest part is really coming back to bite him. Um on reflection yesterday, but it's, it's so disappointing because I kind of agree. I thought that game was meandering towards a draw until Calvin Ramsey burst it into life. But it's the story of our season. We concede sloppy goals and ultimately gifting teams points. But yeah, basically all of the time. And it's, it's just so frustrating. You don't know when it's going to end. It feels like it's never going to end now, but you know, when we go a goal up, you think this could actually happen. Then 2-1 late on, and we still managed to chuck it away to the current worst team in the league, managed by Mark McGee. It's just terrible, terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I knew we would be made to pay. Well, I say we, I mean you, when you said, what do we have to fear um, when we're coming up against a striker that's only scored five goals all season? Yeah. Well... I mean, I'm more feel for our defence rather than how many goal strikers have scored this season. I know, no matter who it is, we seem to just give them up. Uh, you know, I did say maybe Danny Mount's got a point to prove, so maybe I'll hold on to that uh, as just on a personal note, but just very, very frustrating once again. And it, that seems to be the phrase we're coming back to every week, every second week at, at the very least. I know, we really could rinse and repeat most of these episodes when it comes to goals conceded. But um, in terms of the Aberdeen 11 that started the game, Callum, it was the same 11 that um, started in the 3-1 win over Hibs with Funzo Ojo replacing Dylan McGee on the bench. Dylan's injury problems seem to have recurred again, picking up a niggle um, or a knock, maybe walking around Disneyland with the Ramirez family was was too much for him. Uh, unfortunately, not making the squad for this game. And Jack McKenzie and Jack Milne also returned to the first team squad, taking place on the bench. Were you happy enough with that starting eleven, Callum, or slightly disappointed not to see Marley Watkins involved from the start? Yeah, a little bit disappointed. I was surprised, certainly, uh, not to see Marley Watkins start. I suppose Conor McLennan maybe more match fit and uh, coming off the back of a win as well against Hibs um, but then it, it did give us the option to bring Marley Watkins off the bench which obviously proved to be um, somewhat ineffective I suppose but not really through his his fault um, at all um, it, it did all go downhill once Conor McLennan left the field of play make of that what you will um, <laughs> I didn't think he was that bad I, I, was quite, I thought he was quite good and obviously you know whack that shot off the bar which would have been fantastic if that had gone in 
Yeah, I, I suppose in, in defence of Conor McLennan, and he actually did have one of his brighter games. But when it's Conor McLennan, he either does something brilliant or something ridiculous. There's no in between. It's it's one or the other. But Aberdeen did have a bright start, as you said. Calm Dundee re- never really, I kind of felt, got going in that first half. I don't really remember Joe Lewis having a serious save to make. Um, during that first 45, I felt it was kind of all Aberdeen. And as you say, Connor McLennan striking the crossbar. David Bates from a well-worked corner um, after Lewis Ferguson headed the ball back across goal. was really unlucky um, to see his header not find the back of the net, but um, full credit to Alex Lawler with a save to tip over the bar. And then Christian Ramirez still being frustrated in front of goal, having his shot excellently cleared off the line by Cami Kern. I'm pretty sure Ramirez was half wheeling away in celebration. I'm sure half the away end were expecting that to find the net. But Cam, it was it was a bright start. We were just not getting the break of the ball or we were finding Dundee putting their bodies on the line, as you'd kind of expect when there is a, t- a team fighting for their lives. Yeah, certainly. I think credit has to go to Dundee for that, as much as you know we should have made more of the game and and probably come away with three points in the end. They did, you know, put their bodies on the line and I just feel that sort of McCrory chance after the, after uh, it was clear off the line from Ramirez sort of summed things up. Uh, I was sort of half hoping for Ryan Poitras to come in and clear him out again and uh, then we maybe, you know, get something out of that. But that I felt I just summed things up for us. Just a swing and a miss. Uh, very frustrating. But, you know, as I said, we did make uh, some decent chances uh, maybe I feel I almost feel a goal's coming for uh, Master Bates. And um, now you know he, he hit the bar. <laughs> sorry, sorry, he hit the bar uh, against Hibbs, and then great save from Lawler. And um, maybe he's going to be the man that'll step up and get us into that top six next weekend. I would love that. Quite, quite possibly, but I think you know it just shows that we are getting things right at the top end of the pitch. Um, You know, certainly, as we seem to have been doing all season in terms of the data, we're creating loads of chances, but not necessarily always taking them. But I think um, on on reflection on that first half, it wasn't really down to us being wasteful, which I think you can maybe say um, on other occasions this season we have been. Um, This was more down to quite a resolute Dundee um, defensive performance. Yeah, certainly. I suppose on another day, one of those chances probably hits the back of the net and we you know, go 1-0 in front ahead of uh, Ramsey doing so. Um, but that's I suppose that's what happens when you're facing a team bottom of the league fighting for their lives. Sometimes you see it, they don't get the luck because that's just the way it's been for the season. But they, they, were, yeah, they were putting bodies on the line and Lawler pulling off a couple of brilliant saves as well. Uh, credit to them for that but once again just annoying that we can't just be clinical in front of goal um, again Yeah and speaking of being clinical in front of goal it takes us to Christian Ramirez and I think you know how does that chance go into the back of the net we don't speak about this on the podcast and you don't see some of the outcry again on social media around his performance it's no league goal now in a month um, for the American, he last netted up Tawdry in that uh, narrow defeat to Celtic. Um, yes, I know he also did score in the cup game, but in terms of the league, um, it's now a month without a goal. Calm, is Christian Ramirez doing enough for you? We've said it countless times on this podcast, you know, he needs us uh, another player up there, whether it be Connor McLennan, whether it be Marley Watkins, we've seen Jet even back at the start of the season coming in there to support him. Is he doing enough or is the lack of service causing problems for Ramirez? I think it's a big combination of the both. A lot of the times you sort of see Ramirez drifting wide, getting the ball. It was very late, you know, late on in the game when we're chasing a goal and he's out wide on the touchline and sort of try to make things happen. If he's getting the service, he doesn't feel the need to drop deep to get involved in playing and get on the ball. But at times, sometimes his movement is maybe questioned or just, yeah, there's a couple of times where the ball was sort of like floating over him and instead of trying to attempt to play the ball, he's just, I don't know why he's trying to put off the defender or whatever. 
that times it's sort of getting frustrating, but at the same time, sometimes just throughout the season, the service has just been absolutely abysmal to him. And the fact he scored so many goals, uh, it's quite remarkable um, given given that and the fact, you know, he's not scored in a month. But choosing to remain hopeful, maybe if it's not David Bates, it's gonna it's all written in the stars. <laughs> After not scoring for a month, Christian Ramirez will be the man to get us into the top six. But it's just, it just felt sort of another one of those days for, for poor Christian. Um, and it is a combination of the two factors, really. And sometimes these just things happen when it's not going for you, it's not going for you. And that's clearly the case right now. But the, also there's the fact that sometimes when that's happening to players, you know, you can take them out and put someone else in and maybe the, the spell out the team or not come, they're coming off the bench, maybe to make an impact can help them or you get something out of the other player. Right now, no alternatives really to Christian Ramirez, which is really frustrating. Yeah, well, I suppose the only really uh, alternative is Michael Ruth, um, and he only got the the three minutes against Hibbs. But what do you make of his hold up play? Um, a lot has been questioned on his hold up play um, yesterday that he doesn't do enough to hold the ball up when it's played up to him. Uh, a lot of people also saying he, he kind of goes hiding a little bit when things aren't going our way. You know, drifting to the back post, hiding behind defenders. I think on the latter though, I feel he's almost trying to drag defenders away from goal, trying to create space from others. It's not necessarily he's going hiding, he's he's trying to create, but just nobody else is on that wavelength. I certainly agree with that. In terms of sort of the hold-up play, he's not your sort of typical, maybe Scottish football, big number nine hold-up player, put his hmm. body about. He is sort of more of a poacher. Um, and but annoyingly, when you are a lone striker and there is no people like not enough players getting up in support from midfield or the wide areas, you really do need your striker to turn into that player that will mm. hold up the ball, bring other players into play. And um, at times, also he's maybe trying a couple of things too fancy for some of the other players, just not on the on his wavelength too. It's just I don't know what it is. It, it was it's really bizarre that the only time things have. Like when things were looking at their best was when Jet was up there at the start of the season. <laughs> I mean, bring him back, baby. Well, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Is it? Is it that desperate? But um, despite our early frustrations and, and Dundee's defiance, um, their resistance was eventually broken with Calvin Ramsey grabbing his first Aberdeen goal and um, cutting in brilliantly from the right-hand side and hitting a really fine left-footed drive into the near post of Alex Lawler, who'll probably be disappointed to be beaten um, at the near post. I'm sure Dundee fans will be disappointed at that, but take nothing away from Calvin to have the... You know, he tried it a few minutes before, which, which obviously led to that Ramirez chance. But he goes again and he gets his reward. And I'm sure Cormac, who is in attendance, was probably thinking, well, that's another half a million onto your transfer value. Thank you very much. Credit's got to be given, first of all, Dave Cormac picking up those tickets uh, for yeah. the young lads, as we said. I mean, he didn't have to do it, I suppose. And it's a very nice gesture. Um, in terms of Calvin Ramsey, I love the confidence that he had, uh, not only just sort of making things happen and uh, taking on the shot, but twice on his left foot as well, his weaker foot. Um, mm -hmm. I like that. And it you know, it paid dividends. I think maybe you're, you're right to a certain degree that Lawler maybe, any time a goalkeeper gets beat at their new post, you think, you should maybe do better. But the strike from Ramsey was great. As straight as an arrow into, that, uh, into the back of the net. Um, which cued absolute bedlam in the away end, and um, I wish I wish we could have carried it on throughout the rest of the game, but the, the that's the way these things go usually. Yeah, uh, no, I'll, I'll echo your sentiments on Dave Cormack's gesture to to take tickets for the the two people on on Twitter down to the game, a, a good bit of PR. Um, for Dave, but also just a, a good gesture, not something that he needed to do, needed to even respond to. So, um, yeah, just just very good of him. But on the on the goal itself, as you as you say, probably really no stopping that strike. Um, not only did it really live in the away end up, I'm sure, um, as you've just described, because um, it certainly sounded like they were growing frustrated. Certainly from watching at home, it, it felt that way as the first half was going on. But I kind of felt that we almost needed that goal before halftime to kind of reward in a, in a sense that the the play we'd been having and 
almost to not go in nil-nil because that would have given Dundee tremendous confidence um, to, to have held on to, to half-time. And it's probably disappointing that we didn't kick on uh, into the second half going in 1-0 up. Certainly, it's disappointing. Um, it would have been interesting as well being in that Dundee dressing room with Mark McGee probably going Raj uh, after conceding that goal uh, on the brink of half-time. <sighs> It is frustrating that we didn't then go on and, and capitalise on that goal advantage and, you know, go and get another, maybe in a third. Um, but, you know, it, it, cued, it great, cued great scenes of jubilation. But when, often it's home teams where their fans get frustrated when things go on like that and you don't get the breakthrough. But when it's such a big away support, it's, it's almost, it could go either way there. Because uh, such a big fan group can, you know, vocalise their dismay, um, which I th- maybe did start to happen, I suppose. Um, but we got what we deserved in terms of going in uh, in, in a half time in the lead. But it's just just a shame that we couldn't, you know, come out flying out of the traps in that second half and get an early second and maybe kill things off. Because Dundee bottom of the league, the confidence would have just been absolutely sapped, and I'm sure from the crowd as well. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of what frustrates me a little bit. The the confidence should have been sapped from Dundee. And you, I suppose, you know, the, there'll maybe be some Dundee fans tuning into this episode, um, expecting some salty tears coming up later on in the episode. So we probably should give Dundee credit for not, you know, downing tools, not letting their heads drop and, and coming out and being so defiant. Um, I know it's a word that's very much associated with with Dundee is defiant um, and being so in, in the second half and kind of really frustrating us in the second half so much so that after 57 minutes Connor McLennan is replaced by Marley Watkins and um, obviously he's going to become involved in the game as the the second uh, the last half hour um, enters a fray but also Charlie Adam then coming on two minutes later for um, Dundee to a half hour cameo and Callum we, we don't learn our lessons from November's trip to Dens Park do we? we we let Charlie Adam run that midfield for as long as he's on the pitch essentially through legal or illegal means we'll come <laughs> on to that regardless he did come on and absolutely boss it he did the exact same earlier in the season and that was against you know Scott Brown uh, against sort of three more inexperienced midfielders he showed a lot of his experience uh, his nous, but he was spraying the passes. Obviously, the two assists from uh, from set pieces as well. It's just so annoying. And the, he's not in the you know, peak physical condition. He's well into <laughs> his thirties. He's just come back off the back of an injury, and he still comes on and just uses that quality to perfect, just perfectly, essentially, and just absolutely strolled it. For <laughs> it's just so annoying. It's really, really <laughs> frustrating watching him <clears throat> come off that bench. And you just know he's going to have some sort of effect in the game. At that age, in that shape, annoying. I know, I was going to say I let, we let Charlie Adam run the midfield, but I don't think Charlie Adam's run in the last couple of years. No, really but he no, but I mean, he certainly caused some car crash defending um, in, um, from an Aberdeen point of view, which is quite fitting when you associate Charlie Adam in car crashes. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but... In the build-up to that first goal, Callum, um, Charlie Adam was very physical and hands-on with Lewis Ferguson, shall we say. Literally. Jim Goodwin, um, literally. Jim Goodwin, very unhappy with the decision not to award Aberdeen a free kick mm-hmm. um, for the way Charlie Adam treated Lewis Ferguson with a slap to the ear and then maybe another elbow to the front of his face. The, the second of which, on sports scene viewing, doesn't look a lot in it, I'll be honest. Um, but certainly for the first incident, it's a decision you'd expect the referee to give. I was going to say you'd expect John Beaton to give, but let's be honest. Um, however, foul or no foul, the, the play continues out towards Jordan Marshall, who runs at Declan Gallagher and decides to swan dive over Declan Gallagher I've watched the incident countless times and I still don't see where the contact is. Whether it's a bit of naivety from Declan Gallagher and he dangles a leg, similar to the, I suppose, the incident at Tynecastle where Aberdeen got the penalty where Lewis Ferguson sees the leg and, and dives over it. You're giving a referee a decision to make 
And this decision, John Beaton was happy to make and awards Dundee the free kick. But Callum, whether the contentiousness is whether it should have been a free kick to Dundee or not for a dive or should have been a free kick to Aberdeen for an assault on Lewis Ferguson, defend the fucking thing. Come on, man. And we don't do it. Once again in Dundee, we fail to defend a set piece. Set pieces are the the, the opportunity in a game when you are actually settled as a defence, a chance to get organised, you've got time. It should be everyone has a man you stick tight to them, everyone knows their roles. Aberdeen, no, no, no. They have no idea what they're doing. And that's why they should spend the whole week doing set piece drills between now and Ross County, because I'm sure they'll look to capitalise on that as well. It's not the first time we've conceded from just such a soft set piece. Uh, the, the, the second one so certainly won't be the last this season, I'm sure. Just really, really frustrating. In terms of John Beaton, yeah. The amount of times you see something like that and immediately the referee blows up his whistle and gives the free kick. It, to be fair, it could have probably been a free kick to Dundee prior to Charlie Adams flailing arms with mm. Ferguson with m- more than a fistful of his shirt. Um, yeah. And we probably maybe would have conceded from that free kick anyway because that's what we do. But it's just so annoying. But in terms of when you get set up, Stick to your task, stick tight to your man and make sure you're first to that ball. It's the one time you have a chance to be set and organised. And once again, we are the opposite of that. I, I like your, your description there of John Beaton. Yeah, I mean, I think he could sum his refereeing performances against Aberdeen up perfectly using that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, certainly. He just doesn't seem to get any better. But at the same time, it's I, I, it's an, I still don't feel it's any sort of biasness. I just think the officials in Scotland are genuinely terrible. And the fact that they're thinking about putting in VAR and trusting them to then use that as well as if that's going to make it any better when it still won't change free kick calls or whatever like that. What's the point? Yeah, well, I mean, you just need to look at some of the decisions across Scottish football this weekend. Um, I mean, we're going to come on to another one, I suppose, um, slightly later on in the in the lead up to, to our goal, uh, our second goal that is. But but come when you get a free kick, uh, as you said, we just don't seem capable of defending it. We never learn from our mistakes. I don't know what your own football manager record is at defending free kicks, but maybe when we go down to Cormac Park to hand over the Player of the Year award, we can grab five minutes with Jim Goodwin and discuss some defending of set pieces because I'm sure our ideas at defending set pieces can't be any worse than what we're currently witnessing. I know, but and then at, at, at what point is it then not even his fault? Because we've seen this throughout the whole season. The players need to take their responsibility, but it's just time and time again. And it's not... A lot of it is they're experienced players. Some of them are young, granted, but you know, other than probably you know Connor Barron, Calvin Ramsey, they've all played a pretty decent amount of football by this stage. It, and it's, even it's Colin, pieces. It's throughout. You play. You've been dealing with them for how long in your career? You are a professional footballer. It's largely what you've been doing your whole life. Uh, but then even Calvin Ramsey's played thirty games for Aberdeen this season, so it's almost hard to excuse him in this sense. But uh, in for this, you know, this goal, you you really can't blame Calvin Ramsey. Yeah. I think you know for for once, um, I think we all, pro- if in terms of Calvin Ramsey, I think we actually finally saw him probably back to his best, yeah. um, maybe sort of early season form, um, going forward and defensively at, at the weekend. But uh, when you're speaking about players, you know, stepping up, you, you're excusing some of the younger players there. Um, in your last statement there, but you're looking at your experienced players to step up and take control when you're defending Organized. not only a lead, but a set piece. Yet it's probably our most two most experienced players that fail to cope with this, this goal and the next actually, as Jordan McGee gets the better of Lewis Ferguson and beats Joe Lewis at his near post. And I'm really struggling to think what was worse the way he was defended or the fact that the ball somehow beats Joe Lewis. And I still don't know how he gets beat at that near post. No, I mean, we were questioning Lawler if he should have done better at the near post. There's no question about that one for Joe Lewis. Um, Ferguson was not close enough to uh, Jordan McGee either, who, by the way, I have a, 
he's played in so many key moments in my life, I feel almost. Could, uh, scored in my first ever away game at Tyne Castle after he came on as a substitute. Uh, there was also the funny handball at Pataji <laughs> when he was playing for Hearts. And then this one as well. He's just constantly there. He's not, he's not going away. Um, but we should have just we should have dealt with it a lot better. As, as you said, there's experienced players in there. They It's up to them to organise it. It's up to Joe Lewis to organise it. And it's up to him to save headers at the Save the ball. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, he looked to pick up an injury um, during that goal colliding with the post. And whether or not that knocked his confidence or once again, you know, proving why his save percentage is so low. Because to be honest, that was really the first attempt I remember Dundee putting on target their first serious threat and it's a goal story of our season but in credit to Aberdeen because I really didn't see how we were going to recover from that you know you know we'd already brought on Marley Watkins at, at that stage and we didn't really have any other flair players on the bench to, to influence the game, especially then when Calvin Ramsey picks up a knock or maybe it's, as I said, the, the minutes we, we kind of alluded to from the Kazakhstan trip catches up with him and he has to come off to be replaced by Jack McKenzie with 12 to go. It, you're kind of worrying that that top six hopes is fading before our very eyes, um, albeit, you know, still kind of out, out with our control. But we find a way and we get the lead back. Um, slightly controversial. Um, Johnny Hayes' corner headed back across goal. Um, rather disgracefully, um, I think it's got to be said, Vicente right, right. Bissawin throwing himself to the ground. Um, I mean, I don't even think he puts his foot up to, to challenge for the ball. He just throws himself and seems to be very severely injured, much to the frustration of three Dundee defenders um, who go over to express their displeasure. And they'd probably been better, um, you know, getting set and getting focused back on the game and leaving Vicente in a heap. Because as the ball's cleared to, to Jack McKenzie now, having watched this back minutes before we started recording, the pass that Jack McKenzie plays out wide to Johnny Hayes is an absolutely horrendous pass. Mm. I, I think he's absolutely panicking. I, I've written in the notes as a bit of a hospital pass. So much so that Johnny Hayes can hardly control it. It's just a flick toward back towards the box. And there's Marley Watkins with a brilliant header flick towards Ross McCrory. And I mean, I don't know. I think it probably explains why he's leading or currently leading our player of the year vote, steps up at a crucial moment, controls the ball brilliantly and guides the ball beautifully into that bottom corner. And if you said it was wild scenes at the first goal, Callum, well, tops off at the second, was it? I wish I didn't tell you that. Yes, <laughs> it was. Uh, I can't remember if it was me that said or someone else around me that said, if we score a second, uh, to take the lead again tops off I'm like right well okay and then did that and I was like oh god we're going to have to do this now aren't we um, and then about you know maybe nine or ten of us ended up tops off still had them off for the most part when Dundee equalised we sort of had to sheepishly wriggle back in and just oh god what have we done um, it was funny it was funny oh. but um, in terms of the goal um, certainly Vicente Bissell and threw himself to the ground I what do you make of what do you make of? I know obviously probably at the time you were, you know, as as most people bust behind the goal, and um, because you could hear it on, on the TV coverage where claiming for a penalty it was laughably bad. Um, well, I mean, especially with John Beaton in charge, I suppose. But what what do you make of that? Because it's not the first time Vicente has been accused of diving. Um something he needs to eradicate or just a bit of shit house raid that's going to eventually win us a penalty a mm, little bit of shit house raid it, it pro probably will win a penalty at some point down the line but it will also probably come back to bite him um, he probably especially now it's getting highlighted I suppose yeah. on sports scene as well beaten if he had a half decent game should have probably stopped the game Dundee free kick book him for simulation didn't yeah. thank God um, but that's what he should have done uh, mm. It was 
I cl- obviously claimed for it. I, if we'd won the penalty, we'd have been delighted for it. Having watched it back is horrendous, and there's better times to do it other than that one. And the fact he stays down as if he is actually dead, lying <laughs> on the ground, and then sees McCrory coming his way, sort of wriggles out the way along the ground, and then immediately, as soon as we score, goes absolutely mental, um, <laughs> as if he's just got a new lease of life. Uh, quite enjoyed that, but at the same time, it looks so ridiculous, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, it's it's not a good look, but um, on Ross McCrory, I suppose, you know, as a, um, as we said, currently leading our Player of the Year vote. If you haven't, if you are tuned in for the first time and haven't voted, there still is time. The vote is running until the end of the Ross County game. Check out the link in the audio and YouTube description boxes. You will find the links there. Make sure you get your vote involved. Um, all votes do count. But stepping up when it counts. And yeah, Callum, you really think when Ross McCrory puts that ball into the back of net, the net, our fate is in our own hands? It was in our own hands and we decided to just throw it straight at Dundee yeah. again. Um, I didn't think we were going to get that second goal. And then when we did, you almost sort of half expect something else to go wrong. Um, it, we just, it was it's, it's come, it's basically the exact same thing again, just terrible defending um, from the set piece. And it's just, it's just so typical of Aberdeen club to football. Yeah, I mean, how dare Aberdeen make life relatively simple, relatively straightforward. Things wouldn't be fun. These podcasts wouldn't be emotional um, and have us raging at poor defending twice. Don't get me wrong, it would be very animated in terms of delight, given the fact that there's a good chance (laughs) for us in the top six. Now, not so much, but funny regardless, I suppose, if you look at it that way. Yeah, I really wasn't laughing as the ball hit the back of the net. Um, What did you make of the decision to give Dundee that second free kick? Marley Watkins has said he had his involvement, as did Charlie Adam in that last half hour. Watkins grabbing the assist for Marley Watkins' goal, but ultimately gives away the free kick. A really, probably cheap free kick um, if you want, but again, you're giving the referee the decision to make. Needlessly clatters into Charlie Adam after he's played the pass. Again, you want to use the word experience, Charlie Adam going down very quickly and John Beaton giving the free kick and once again Aberdeen failing to defend it. But thoughts on that initial free kick decision? Well, first of all, hello, Charlie, if you're tuning in. Let's contrast his comments after the game about Lewis Ferguson with the way he has then also subsequently, okay, he's been clattered into a little bit, but... He's just shown how strong he is, etc. And he said those words after the game. He's also just thrown himself to the ground a little bit as well. He's done the exact same thing Lewis Ferguson does do occasionally as well. Okay, then. So before we get into the 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 goal, let's. I was going to look at this after, but since you brought it up now, we'll we'll do it now. Thoughts on those comments from Charlie Adam over the top or accurate? Uh, I don't think we can complain too much about. Lewis Ferguson does like to buy a free kick and he does throw himself to the ground. Whether you look at that as he's playing the game very well or he's just, you know, throwing himself to the ground too easily and he shouldn't do that, that's up for debate, I suppose, too. But it's maybe a word you have with Lewis Ferguson. Um, I don't know if, you know, maybe he would want to do that. But to come out and say it like that when he's doing the exact same thing, Really, I mean, when he's a lot more experienced than Lewis Ferguson as well, um, but, but I, I think also agree to some extent. But in terms of the manner of he did he has get hit got hit in the face twice also at the same time. Yeah, but I I can see where he's coming from because there's a lot of games, um, and I suppose it's why you know people were were calling for Lewis Ferguson to be be captain because there are a lot of times in games when decisions don't go our way that Lewis Ferguson is chasing the referee around the pitch. Yeah screaming and asking why we don't get the decision. And I suppose, in a way, that's what Charlie Adams referring to. The amount of times we cry about not getting a decision, while the more you cry, the more unlikely you are to get it. Um, you know, I say that to Rory a lot of time. If you don't stop crying, I'm not going to give you your chocolate. So I don't believe he cries. <laughs> he, seems, he seems too sweet for that. 
That definitely does. That's just all for show, that sweetness. But, you know, it, it, it's really frustrating to watch because I do think the comments were maybe slightly o- over the top, but especially, you know, if you are getting an elbow in the on your nose, you know, you're not exactly going to be best pleased about that. But once again, Charlie Adam, you know, he got in Scott Brown's head and had Scott Brown on strings. It took him best part of two minutes to get Lewis Ferguson on strings and then run the midfield. So I don't know whether it's kind of a fair comment on Lewis Ferguson in terms of his overall game, Mm. but maybe it just says more about how easy it is to get an Aberdeen player to kind of lose control. And then, you know, we've spoken about this a lot of the time on the podcast about where the, the fact that our midfield if our midfield performs, Aberdeen perform well and we mm. tend to go in and get a result. If it doesn't perform well, we tend to lose the game. Mm-hmm. We haven't obviously lost this game, but we lost control of the game very quickly after Charlie Adam came on. And I think it says more about Charlie Adam than it does about Lewis Ferguson. I think so too. At the same time, he's probably... Charlie Adam knows exactly what he's doing in these things. He's got his experience of it over the years um, and maybe he's sort of suggesting Lewis Ferguson... I know what I'm doing. I'm I I've been doing it for years. He's got mm. a lot to learn, essentially. I think maybe he does in terms of that, but at the same time, what Luke Ferguson does, he generally does pretty well. He does, unless it's defending free kicks. Well, because from said resulting free kick, once again, Lewis Ferguson and Joe Lewis don't cover themselves in glory, but a good ten yards away from the play. Neither does Declan Gallagher, because as well as Declan Gallagher has been playing this season, for some reason, I don't know who, he's not even marking anybody, but he Ellen. plays Danny Mullen onside by starting his run too early. David Bates, I also don't know what he's doing, Anyone. standing there with his hand up, but Lewis Ferguson gets caught out. And it is a good ball in from mm-hmm. Charlie Adam. As Jack Ross said, if you play the ball in between the sticks in that sort of area, as long as it gets contact with a forward, you've got a good chance of getting on target. But as I said last night, as a keeper, I remember going to a, a goalkeeping coaching thing and Jim Layton was there and he says, if you're a goalkeeper and you commit to coming, you don't stop. Mm. Once you commit, you go through the, the defenders, you go through everything. Nine times out of ten, the goalkeeper will probably get the decision anyway. That's how well protected they are. Joel Lewis thinks about coming, stops on a six-yard box, and Danny Mullen's header sails past him. It's just all round calamitous once again. We just learn no lessons, mm. whether it's week in, week out, or... 10 minutes, 20 minutes after it first happens. We just don't learn. Nope, not at all. I think certainly, having, having watched it back, um, Joe Lewis half-farced it, basically, uh, and then he was sort of in no position to either save it uh, or come out and collect the ball. Um, and it's really frustrating. I mean, Danny Mullins not the tallest player in the park at all, but he absolutely does his job. And to be fair, the ball is absolutely on the money from Charlie Adam. Uh, not being able to see if it was offside, but players standing, complaining, that's not going to help at all. Defend it, Mm -hmm. if it's offside, then complain, whatever. But it's just, once again, set pieces, man. If if you can see two goals from a set piece like that in a game, arguably you don't deserve to finish top six or win the game or whatever. But just once again, it's the same errors over and over again. I said it before, not the first time it's happened, won't be the last and you just hope that they, they can sort of sort it out. But you mentioned there Bates and for, um, Gallagher, two experienced players now, two centre-halves. It's on them to organise it for the most part. And they've not done that. And we've given away another cheap goal and ultimately given away the game. Simple. And, yeah, and it really is. It's We've given away the game. We've given away two points and it's out of our hands whether or not we make the top six. But... I suppose on the, the two centre-backs there, I, I I mean, for those that haven't watched the back, we'll probably need to to see what I'm referring to about, about Depp and Gallagher kind of going early sports, you know, show the line um, that kind of indicates that Danny Mullins probably onside. But by that point, David Bates is already standing mm. 
with his hand up because he can't see that Declan Gallagher is already in front of him because he's behind him. Um, but through the week, um, Aberdeen were linked with St Mirren defender Charles Dunn. Um, a six-figure fee for Charles fucking Dunn. Wow. Um, I mean, I don't think we should be spending six figures on him, but can you see why, after that sort of performance in terms of defending set pieces, mm. why Jim Goodwin is looking at another centre-half? I especially, totally understand sorry, especially when Mikey Devlin has, say it quietly, sef- suffered another setback. Who's surprised? Not me. Uh, not me either. Um, in terms of Charles Dunn, though, when you see sort of on the face of it, six figures, 29-year-old defender, St. Mirren, you're like, oh, God, what's going on here? Um, I can certainly understand why Jim Goodwin's looking for uh, another centre-back. It's a player he's worked with, uh, clearly a player he's fond of. Um, it wouldn't enthuse me particularly, but at the same time, the defenders on our books right now not doing the job at all. And I can imagine both David Bates and Declan Gallagher on rather high wages uh, in, in mm. terms of what, what we can pay. Um, it, it would be an interesting one. Also interesting, as we've had our um, qualms about Joel Lewis, uh, not only just in this episode, but throughout the season, apparently Jack Annick set to go to Cardiff City uh, instead. A player that we're you know probably going to miss out on. He's also divided opinion, but I don't think you can argue with bringing in a a sort of premiership quality goalkeeper to at least compete with Joe Lewis and push him on further at a very minimum. So it'll be interesting to see where we go after that. Yeah, that's going to be a really interesting one to see kind of what avenue we go down. And I suppose as well, what makes next week um, so important now, Callum, is if we fail to get top six, that is going to seriously impact our finances. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you want to blame Dave Cormack, Stephen Glass, you just need to look at Aberdeen's record this season. The fact that if we win and get into the top six, that will be the lowest points achieved getting into the top six. I mean, I don't know what that says about Aberdeen or the the league this season. I think a lot about both. But we've only kept four clean sheets all season with two away wins this season. And as I said, if you want to blame Cormac, the Stephen Glass project, nothing seemed to have worked this season. Jim Goodwin has come in and tried to steady the ship and he's going to have that opportunity to get into top six football. But that could be massive for the club's finances. That could be massive in terms of getting that goalkeeper, getting that centre half, also attracting a certain quality of player because if we do scrape, and let's be honest, it will be scraping into the top six. There's really no celebrating about it because it will be by the skin of our teeth. But it gives us that opportunity to not only get the higher you know, prize money from the finishing as high up in the league, but gives us a very faint chance of fighting for fifth place and getting into Europe um, through the, the default position um, due to the Scottish Cup, um, obviously depending on what Hibernian Football Club, Club do. So really is a huge game next week, Callum, because bottom six football consigns us to the league, uh, the Premier Sports Cup group stages, mm-hmm. and that's going to take a huge knock to the, the four, probably the budget um, and, and the finances as well. Four far away does sound pretty good though, so six and a half a dozen. Yeah, well, especially when you are when you see the Hearts are a game away from a guaranteed £3 million. Exactly. No, no, it is, it is mental. Um, it's so annoying that we've somehow fumbled this. Uh, I've just done a quick calculation, and it is correct. We've kept clean sheet in 12.5% of our league games so far this season. That is utterly horrendous. Um, in, terms, as you, in terms of attracting players, um, you know, not only financially, but the rewards you have, but it's also direct rivals that are then going to have these uh, extra incentives. Uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, potentially Dundee United. Uh, perhaps you pr- previously would have been like, well, Aberdeen's probably be a more attractive club to go to than Dundee United. All of a sudden, they've got a little bit more money. They've got some European football to offer. Motherwell, Hibs, Hearts, certainly now. And, and the shooting ourselves, thing is we as well, ourselves in the foot, essentially. We have, and, and unfortunately, we've only got ourselves to blame. And again, whether you want to blame the players, chairman, management, whatever, 
overall, Aberdeen can only blame themselves for being in this position this season. And unfortunately, missing out on Europe could seriously impact the quality of player because as you say there, Callum, it's direct rivals. You've got the likes of Dundee. They train in St Andrews. That means living probably, you know, in Edinburgh is viable for these players. When you're playing for Aberdeen, I think Declan Gallagher still commutes up from um, Dundee where his family stays. But most of the other players would have to come up and live in Aberdeen. And for I don't know why, but for a lot of players, that's a very unattractive proposition. I mean, it's a beautiful it's place to stay. It. Yeah. I mean, it's currently raining as we're recording this. So, um, But, you know, if, if players aren't enthralled or enthused by the prospect of living in Aberdeen, if we don't have Europe as a carrot to dangle in front of them, whereas a Hearts or potentially a Dungeon United, they do, what's a player going to choose? Otherwise, you're going to have to start throwing more money to maybe lure this player. And that's not really a road you want to go down. Not at all. I, I think annoyingly, um, naturally, the fact these clubs are based in the central belt, that does give them somewhat of an advantage. Uh, the opportunity to live in uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, whatever, uh, as much as we have our own views on these places. Um, yes. For a lot of people, it, it can be a huge factor being able to live there rather than up the road when you're you know, maybe a little bit isolated as well and it's a place you've not heard much about, etc. Um, mm-hmm. And plus the financial aspect, they'll maybe be able to offer a little bit more money as well and it just makes things so much difficult in a time where we've already... You know, recruitment's not been great uh, over the no. last sort of, well, I say year, uh, longer than that, let's be honest. Um, it's, it's it's really, really frustrating. And although, you know, sneaking into fifth would not be a massive win for us, it's not where we want to be at all. In terms of going ahead and giving us a platform to build off going into next season and further on down the line, it could be absolutely massive. And that starts with doing our business, making sure we take care of our side of the deal and getting a win against Ross County. Things might not fall into place, but if we do that, then we've got half a chance anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just looking at what the the prize money is um, this season. And the difference between finishing sixth, so if you finish sixth in the league, it's £1.56 million. And seventh position is £1.43 million. So you're looking at £130,000 difference. Um, probably a Charles Dunn there, um, judging exactly, by our six figures. Um, I mean, currently we're we're obviously sitting in, in ninth right right now. That that rewards you with £1.31 million um, currently. So again, you're looking at £250,000 mm. of a difference between where we are just now and finishing sixth. That for Aberdeen. It is huge, mm. um, especially, you know, in, in a time where, you know, people are being affected by cost of living prices rising. You know, people will have tough decisions to make in, in the coming weeks about, you know, season ticket renewals and um, obviously with the early bird deadline coming up um, this weekend as well. You know, the club will be hoping that a lot of these fans do so they can get cash in the bank um, and then start budgeting. As you, as you say, it's going to be a real test of Darren Mowbray um, and his team and what they can recruit for us this summer. But Jim Goodwin and the players really need to do all they can to kind of help that and, and help that budget by by getting that top six. And that's really how, how important. Even if you look at fifth place, that's 1.68 million um, you know, again, a huge, huge difference. And that's um, not even taken into what you get from getting more bombs on seats and the extra European games, the prize money from that, et cetera, as well. Exactly, exactly. And I, I know, you know, people will say, yeah, but you'll have the costs of, you know, travelling to the likes of Kazakhstan, which is probably where we'll end up if we do get Europe. But again, as you say, the, the ex- extra incentive of the European games versus a League Cup group stage game, you'll probably get for one European game what you'll get for two. I don't even know how many home games you get in the group stages. But I think it's two or three, maybe. Yeah, well, you're not exactly going to be getting 18,000 at home no. to Fraserburgh if that's who we get in the League Cup group stages. Is that and you hoping they'll win the league so they get in, is it? I am absolutely hoping they win the league, yes. It's very tense at the top of the Highland League. 
but actually more exciting than following Aberdeen right now. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Anyway, on to Ross County this weekend. I said it is a win is an absolute must if we have any hope of making the top six. But to make the top six come, not only do Aberdeen need to win, we need to hope that Hibernian fail to win at Tynecastle. I never like having to trust Hibs to do something or trust Hearts, I suppose, in this case. I don't like either. I hate either. They're so unreliable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, I think if we draw, no, if we win and Hibs even draw, we'll be okay with goal difference. But Yes, Hibs, Hibs have, to, have to win. We would knock Hibs out on goal difference. And I suppose... Quite remarkably, we have the best goal difference, and that's why it's worked Mental. so much in our favour that the that Livingston and Motherwell, uh, Motherwell, who are currently occupying one of the remaining places in the top six, that is why that game is almost being taken out of the equation. Unless I think Livingston win that game six nil or something, but then again, we would still with a win go above Motherwell. Um, so us and Livingston would get in at the expense of Hibs depending on the outcome so it really is we need to win and it's really the the game at Tynecastle that's only got the other direct impact on our top six ambitions it's uh, it's a big concern always having to rely on others but as I said we need to take care of our own business and the fact it's Ross County is not ideal given they've been pretty good this season uh, better yeah. than us and mm. but the one fact is maybe the fact it's at home, but hopefully a good crowd as well that might turn away. Because if it was away from home, we'd be as well just sorting things out for four or far away <laughs> next season. Now we would have, we would have been hopeless. Yeah, I mean it really is. It's a blessing that the game is at home, given as you say our dreadful away record. But you know Ross County really impressed when they came to Tawdry earlier in the season. It took a very last minute scrambled over the line by Christian Ramirez to to scrape a one one draw. Of course, that was a similar scoreline when we travelled to um, Dingwall in midweek in January. So a team we've not yet beaten this season. And as you say, a team that have actually looked quite good under Malky Mackay, um, kind of being inspired by Regan Charles Cook and others as well. Obviously, it's not just a one-man show there. But Callum, how confident are you going into this game that we will make the top six? You're not going to like this. I'm not actually confident. <laughs> I'm not confident. <laughs> I'm hopeful, but not confident that it'll happen. Not only because of us, but because of all the, the, the other things that come into play as well. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's it's just getting a bit nervy now. I'm getting a bit tetchy, and I'm uncomfortable about this, that the fact it's come down to this. Um, uh, Ross County are a very good side. We've not been in this season. I suppose now is a no. good time to start, as any, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I'm I'm probably the exact same, hopeful but not confident. I think too many people are almost disregarding Ross County and just assuming that we will turn up and beat them where they've shown this season, apart from probably two performances this season where they've really been ragdolled um, and both of them have admittedly come away from home. Um, yeah, they have more than held their own this season and deservedly... You know, let's not be about the bush. If Ross County win this game, they also, you know, depending on re- results at Tynecastle, get into the top six. And all, so, all of a sudden, if they end up in the top six and somehow finish in fifth and get into Europe, then we've got them to worry about as well. <laughs> yeah. Competition. And also, if they go on to win the game and get into the top six, we're denied another trip to the Mallard. True. Didn't even think of that. Wow. Yes. Okay. That's not yeah. great at all. I know. I mean, that would be the only silver lining if we missed out on the top six, providing Ross County do as well, um, is a trip to the Mallard and potentially Easter Road as well for those that like their away days and days out towards the end of the season. But just looking at um, Ross County's recent away form, Callum, you know, form in general, um, two wins um, and two defeats in their last four games. Um beating Dundee and Motherwell, losing 2-0 to Hibs and 4-0 to Celtic, um, both of those games away from home. Um, albeit the Motherwell win, I think that was also away from home. I could be wrong on that. Um, but it was just one defeat in five, I, I noticed, and that was against Celtic. But the four games that they've had, um, um, when they beat St Johnston, St Mirren, 
drew with Hearts. Um, they've had less than 50% possession in these games. So, you know, Aberdeen as a team that have liked to have, have a hold of the ball this season, that's not going to phase Ross County. As I said, very good on the counter-attack, led by Regan Charles Cook on one wing, Joseph Hungbo on the other. Jordan White up top is a good target man, you know, good in the air, also quick as well, can cause us real problems. We, we've got to be wary of this Ross County side. As I said, I feel too many people are just expecting us to turn up and win this game. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be as easy as that. Especially with our defence. <laughs> well, that too. That too yeah. and I, I mean, it's, I suppose the fact they're coming here, that might that might suit them. They're comfortable not being, uh, not being on the ball uh, for the majority of the game as well. A real I, on the counter and they've got a better away form than us so nothing's I mean, a guarantee not no true but nothing's a guarantee and it's just all this talking about is actually making me even more concerned and I don't know if you can tell I'm not happy about it not great at all mm. but I suppose them coming here probably suits them more I want to go back to a point you made in when we were speaking about the Dundee game in, a, in the fact that that large away crowd that was at Dens Park could have had an influence on the team because we turn quite quickly. You know, like most supports, when things aren't going our way, our support does tend to turn, get on the players' back. Let's be honest, we're both as guilty as the next person for doing so. Um, how much are Ross County going to come here, do you think, and look to frustrate us and get that crowd turned? Because, Callum, it'll probably take about 15 minutes at most to really frustrate that home crowd and get possibly the moans and groans starting to come off the terraces and feed onto the pitch. I mean, I'm sure, you know, Malcolm McKay has been in the game long enough now to know that's exactly what he should be doing. You know, mm. set up, try and frustrate us to start with and then they'll grow into the game as we grow more unsettled and, you know, they're very capable going forward and, um, decent defensively as well probably better than us defensively too and uh, it's exactly what they'll try and do I've no doubt about that they will come up and try and frustrate us to start with and then grow into the game and we've seen how we deal with that uh, at times as well terribly yeah. for anyone who's not aware so <laughs> it's a real concern it really is yeah and you know County very impressive in that 1-1 draw um, up at Dingwall against Hearts and I think Hearts very much have Craig Gordon to thank for um, leaving um, Dingwall with that point um, on, on Saturday but pretty much the story of their season is being thankful for Craig Gordon I guess but on Aberdeen Callum we've been managing Marley Watkins over the last two games he's been getting cameo appearances we've got to start him against Ross County don't we? Yeah, I think so. A bit more minutes under the leg uh, in his legs now uh, after that game. Another couple of weeks in training. To I think it has to be the case. Really, Conor McLennan's done okay. We've been critical at times in terms of the game against Dundee. He was pretty good. Pretty good. Certainly yeah. not the worst out there. I suppose that's but, nothing against Conor McLennan specifically. It's just. I would say our best starting eleven yeah. includes Marley Watkins. Certainly, and and he's when you're as well, it makes more sense. Yeah, and when you're coming up against a must-win game, you must play your best players. Exactly. I think that's just, I think that's just common sense. So, Marley Watkins for me must start um, this weekend. Do you make any other changes to the starting eleven? No, I hope Calvin Ramsey's okay. That and it was just sort of a little bit of cramp. I don't think I make any further changes because. Although we have got a bit stronger in terms of depth, I don't know. Well, I suppose maybe another one you might question is maybe Andy Constein's involvement. Yeah, I've seen a few folk speaking about that, getting Andy Constein involved, but where'd you play him? Well, not left back, for that's for sure. Um, but do you take out one of the centre halves? Maybe now at this stage, I don't know, because they had performed, had sort of getting a bit more of an understanding together. It's now the time to just sort of throw Andy Gonstein back in. I don't know. Will he fix anything? I don't know. But at the same no. time, we have been disastrously at times too. So it's a bit of a cast right too. I don't think Jim Goodwin will put him in. Um, no. But it'll be interesting. As much as I'd love to see him come in and save our season for our sentimental value alone, I don't know if that is realistic. Um, I'm going to say if he starts, it won't make a difference. 
Um, wow. But I know there's far too many people out there, yourself included, that want him to play and mm-hmm. turn it around, as you say, for sentimental reasons. Um, but I just I just don't see it. My, my concern, um, I'll say concern, slash fear is that he <laughs> folk are going to be laughing and um, that he's lost any yard of pace he already had with this injury um, and how he how he copes with that in a game I think there's too much riding on this game to to throw Andy Considine back in uh, as I said you've got Regan Charles Coop Joseph Hungbo Jordan White's physical he's quick I mean whether you love him or not, Andy Constant wasn't exactly the fastest player in our team. You don't want to slow our defence down even further. You know, people have been on at Johnny Hayes for losing his yard of pace. Well, you don't exactly want to chuck another yardless of pace back there with Andy Constantine there. Well, what are we so mean him about him? Just say you don't want him to start and leave it there. God, hasn't the man started well, enough? Just justifying it. I'm just justifying it. I'm not here for the sentiment. I'm here to to see the team do well. Keep it to your self. I don't hear that. <laughs> he can he can come in for all sentimental purposes once we're resigned to the bottom six. Hell yeah. I'd like that. Five games of Andy Constein. That'd be pretty good. Um, but yeah, I don't really think there's anything else to look at currently from an Aberdeen point of view because other than that, I suppose, selection um on Marley Watkins, whether he starts or not. There kind of really is much else that can influence. I think our midfield looks set. Um, it's vital we get something up there in support of Christian Ramirez and whether it's Bazawin and Watkins or Bazawin and McLennan, that the service and speed from both of them is there because we really need to be kind of testing that Ross County defence and um, trying to cause them problems. We don't want... Um, them to come out and kind of dictate the play we're as you said we're the home side it's really crucial Calm. I think that, that we come out and dictate the tempo because Ross County aren't going to be scared to not have the ball but we need to be the the ones dictating and, and creating the creating the play 100% I don't think there's really much else to add to that it's just my nerves are going to build towards the back end of the week it's not going to be fun <laughs> and it's what we sign up for, I suppose. It is. Um, well, it is going to be a nervous wait, I suppose, up until match day. Hopefully, um, this episode has kind of helped pass the time leading up to match day. Uh, I was going to say helped ease any nerves, but I definitely don't Made think that will. Yeah, definitely don't think that's going to be the case. But as always, thank you for your continued support to the episode. Tweet us at RTG underscore podcast with your thoughts ahead of the weekend. Will we make the top six or not? If you're watching on YouTube, leave a like, leave a comment again around your thoughts on the top six, bottom six debate and the financial impact that this will have on the club. Because as we've alluded to on this episode, it is going to be quite impactful. But Callum, thanks very much to you. Enjoy your few days down in Kirkcaldy and we'll reconvene next week. I know people are going to say nobody ever does that. Leave me alone. Uh, Also, don't forget to vote down below. Thanks very much for tuning in. See you later.